I'm Jeff Tweedy from the rock band Wilco, and we are currently sitting in the loft studio and rehearsal space that we've had for, I don't know, 17 years or so. I've read a lot about the migraines that you used to get. Um, when did those start? Uh, I don't really remember when they started. I, my, I think right around six years old or something, I started getting pretty serious headaches where I would vomit until I was dehydrated and, you know, uh, uh, just kind of full blown migraine yeah. experience. When did depression start? Who knows? I mean, I, I didn't really identify it until much later, but I kind of recognized that the, the patterns of it were existent for a long time. Uh, like probably there was, there's a theory I have that, um, that I don't know if it's borne out by any kind of scientific research, but I think that the depression and anxiety has has some connection to the migraines for me, or maybe just the stress of those uh, psychological mood disorders uh, would contribute to migraines. But in a, some ways, I think that migraines were a way of making psychic pain visible hmm. to uh, the people around me that weren't able to see that there was real psychic pain. You know, like, I think that's a problem everyone that suffers from depression has is that it it doesn't look real and everybody gets sad and everybody has a certain amount of depression. So people that don't really experience it as a, a, uh, a disorder, um, tend to think, well, why can't you just not be sad, right? Yeah. yeah. So uh, I think that throwing up 30 times in a row and, and being obviously in an enormous pain could have had some sort of connection early on that I didn't make until later. So you felt like you you were your body was converting all this psychic pain into an actual Something migraine. that would be nurtured. Yeah as opposed to be, uh, being reacted to with, um, I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> <laughs> and then when did uncle Tupelo begin in earnest? When Jay's brother went away to join the military, I believe, uh, as that began to ramp up and, and gain momentum, what was happening with your mental health now that you were an adult and you were a musician, you were doing, doing the thing that you like to do. I don't think my mental health was particularly great, but I think that, um, I had started drinking. So there was some maladaption, uh, that's pr fairly common, um, with, Diminishing returns, as is fairly common. Yeah. Were you drinking just for fun, or were you trying to, for nerves, or what? Uh, I think I wanted to feel normal, uh, and it felt like I felt more normal when I drank. I'm, a, I'm definitely an alcoholic, and so that's like a you know, where have you been my whole life? But I was also very, very conflicted by that because I've come from a family of alcoholics and I have a lot of, uh, anxiety about that going into it. Uh, cause you thought that was in uh, your like future. I, like, yeah, I'm, I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. You know, was it a family as far as you know, that were they drinking to self-medicate? Were there mental things that's going on? Pretty, I think that's pretty clear. Now, yeah, um, I always had a theory that my dad he drank his whole life and uh was always kind of determined that he was an alcoholic by everybody and and as I got went through treatment and got better, I started kind of questioning whether that was an accurate description uh because he didn't have the 
typical diminishing returns and the and the catastrophic consequences that come along with you know advancing through the stages of alcoholism he kept a job he was completely reliable um but he drank 12 beers a day you know wow. at least and a case on the weekends or you know so um but at some point he went through some uh, medical issues and he stopped drinking like at 81 years old and he started having panic attacks mm. but he didn't have any troubles not drinking wow so how is that different than your experience with alcohol uh you're not 81. i didn't go through treatment to stop drinking so it wasn't a particularly so it's a similar experience. Yeah, it was it seemed fairly easy to stop. The reason I say I'm an alcoholic is it's an easiest. It's the easiest term and most accurate to me. Like it's just the same as saying I'm an addict. Yeah. But you said that your father was. You think he might not have been an alcoholic, but you are. So what's the difference? My dad never graduated to other substances. Hmm. How long did that take you to graduate to those? Uh, you know, probably. I didn't tend to intermingle them very much. Mm -hmm. So I quit drinking when I was like 22 years old. And then not long after that, I smoked pot for a while, which isn't, I still don't think it's that, that serious of a, of a drug. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think it should be taken seriously, but I don't, it's not in the same category. Somewhere after pot stopped being something I could do because it ang it increased my anxiety. Mm. I like could this is right right around the time that um, uh, my first son Spencer was conceived, and I we found out I was going to be a father. It was really hard to let go of control enough to enjoy being high, mm -hmm. and anxiety seemed to really really take a big bite out of the enjoyment of that. But not long after that, on the road, I discovered pills. Uh, and those had the opposite effect. They had the, the, the illusion of being more in control for me. I, 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 I wasn't very comfortable with oblivion. I wasn't com ever really super comfortable with, even when I drank, I liked being the guy that could drink a lot and not seem drunk. Mm -hmm. at all. I, did, I, I was not the guy that got super, super drunk and everybody uh, had to take care of, you know. Were you trying to, you, you enjoyed that because you were able to show that you had control? I, I think I just didn't like losing control. Yeah. You know, but, um, but, but opioids were uh, like this warm feeling of well-being. And uh, I honestly, that was, that's, probably the biggest drug of choice or most m closest to my my heart <laughs> in mm -hmm. terms of uh, what I thought was good for me. I honestly even thought it was good for me. Like, why is this, how is this any different from taking antidepressants or something? You know, like I had like some really screwed up logic that I'm fairly decent at debating. I actually convinced a psychiatrist to prescribe me opioids at one point. Wow, you're good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it was like, a pro well, he was bad, I think is probably more accurate. But um, the, the combination of, I, felt, I think I felt like, this is what other people feel like. I have energy. Mm -hmm. I'm not panicking. Uh, I feel good and clear and warm and I can concentrate and uh, uh, that was my, my, my reaction to the first, you know, uh, experiences with opioids. Um, had you been diagnosed with depression at this point? Yeah. When did that happen? Um, I don't really know. Probably the mid nineties, late nineties. Okay. And what, uh, what did you do about it then? What was the, the course of treatment? Um, uh, some talk therapy, uh, some medication, and some uh, benzodiazepines for for the anxiety, mm -hmm. uh, which is 
terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> Which, but the t- they're prescribed for anxiety all the time. But I, ju- I just think that that's a really uh, diminishing return type of band aid for that particular disorder. Yeah. And um, the, honestly, the guy that I was seeing for the longest time uh, in terms of having a therapist, somebody to talk to, I think was uh, criminally negligent. How so? Uh, he would talk me out of taking antidepressants and tell me that the opioids were okay. He'd say that the antidepressants are capping your uh, your energy, your creative energy. Jesus. But the opioids, I mean, you enjoy them. You have a good time. You like, you know. Is this, um, are you talking about Dr. Feelgood from the Motley Crue songs? Was he your actual? No, he wasn't able to prescribe anything. This guy was just, you know, like a social worker, you know, like a lot of, that's this thing that scares me about the mental health profession is uh, there's so many different uh, ways to just hang a shingle out and, 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 and start damaging people, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, I think it's really, really awful. I mean, I think that guy also had some sort of delusions of grandeur that he had a, at that time in Chicago, and and, uh, I think he had some illusions that he was dealing with a celebrity client Mm -hmm. and that he was eventually going to be asked to just come on the road. In fact, he asked my manager that that actually told my manager that was the only way I was really going to be okay is if he started coming on the road with us. That's a red flag. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, like he, but, I mean, but that is so, um, he was just smart enough to uh, recreate the dynamics in my life that were causing me my neurotic condition. What do you mean? How is he recreating it? Well, everybody has these relationships in, the, in their life that are dysfunctional and they contribute to an, a, 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 their impediments to, get, to getting healthy, um, say a relationship with your mother or blah, 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 you know, whatever. Uh, for somebody in that position to see somebody vulnerable, identify what those dynamics are and then, then recreate them so that you are dependent upon them. Mm. is is evil hmm. i think and that was I, to me that's what the what what happened yeah how did you get cleaned up like what what I went uh, to the hospital yeah i i went i actually quit taking everything uh the my panic disorder worked in my favor in this regard i realized that there was something terrible happening and i started panicking Every time, every time I put a pill in my mouth, I, I would panic that I'm going to die. And I'd try and make myself vomit. You know, like it was, it was almost became impossible to take meds of any kind, and including antidepressants and, and, and things that might have been helping me to some degree. So I was able to do that. I was able to stop taking pills. And about five weeks after that, my brain chemistry, uh, had crashed severely to the point where I was panicking 24 hours a day, just like walking around the park. I lost 35 pounds. Um, and, uh, this guy that was, I was seeing, uh, to, uh, supposedly help me. It's like, therapist he made this suggestion that he was, was going to have to go on the road with me since I was in this condition and I had a moment of you're just a fucking total asshole you're just like you're sickening you know I was just like this clear clear vision of who this guy was and I couldn't drive because I was panicking too much and he I, I made him take me home and he sped off (laughs) after I got out of the car. And then my my wife took me to the emergency room, and um, they did this two days in a row. Like, they didn't really, they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't admit me. And then the second day I went there, they they told me about a place in Chicago that has 
dual diagnosis uh, treatment, which is they treat your mental health issues along with your addiction issues. And, and I, my reaction to that was, why has no one told me about this until just now? This is obviously, this makes so much sense. That's obviously what's been going on for fucking ever. And yes, please take me to there now. So it was the ER that referred to that. Yeah. Wow. Um, and then how long were you there? A month. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then a little bit of time at a halfway house mm -hmm. uh, to just kind of ease back into being a dad and a husband. And Did you have to sort of ease back into playing music too? Or a little you been bit. playing the whole time? A little bit. Um I did have a guitar at some point towards the end of my stay in the hospital. And I think it, um, I had one when I went to the halfway house and I was playing it in the laundry room. And this older black gentleman came up to me and said, you know, you've got something. <laughs> and he said, uh, you should, uh, you just lack confidence. You should get out there and play for people and and get some confidence because you got something. And it was the absolutely the best review I've ever gotten in my life because <laughs> it was completely unsolicited. No, it was, it was as pure as it can get. And a pretty good prescription for what you needed to yeah, do next. Yeah, and it was like he had me, he had me pegged. I don't have a lot of confidence. <laughs> but... Um, but yeah, and, and, and you know, I developed a, a relationship with the doctor who treated me in the hospital, mm -hmm. who I, I still see, you know, I still helps me maintain my, my, my meds and, and be a functioning human being. Uncle Tupelo ends, uh, Jay quits the band and, you know, you go in, in different directions. There have been some people fired from Wilco over the years, uh, d did what was happening within you, within your mental health, play a role in some of these relationships and friendships and partnerships ending? Um, I think that the that Jay Bennett leaving uh, Wilco was, uh, at least for me personally, was a first step towards getting healthier. Um, on, you know, and that's, I don't know if Jay, from what I know, sadly didn't, wasn't able to get the help that he needed to, to readjust his life to a more healthy, you know, lifestyle. But at the time he left, it was not a healthy thing. And I was trying it, you know, to distance myself from things that I was becoming aware were not very good for me. And uh, we offered Jay help, you know, getting to, getting to rehab, um, getting himself together. He didn't, he refused or declined uh, at that time, and he claimed to not have any problem. Hmm. Like a lot of people do. And, and, and the situation was untenable. The situation always gets cast as, a, as a, some sort of me versus him issue. It was not, I mean, obviously there was an issue between me and him, but it was a, it was a band wide um, uh, decision and a situation where the the health of the band was at stake, not just my relationship with Jay. In yeah, we won't walk through every song you've played for clues to depression or or mental illness. Um, are there songs that you can think of that uh, that were written about your struggles and and you know your your depression that that uh, either written during some throws of it or reflecting back on it that uh, we could look to? The record that was the last record I made before I went in the hospital was A Ghost is Born. And when um, I got out of the hospital and we started 
rehearsing again for uh, to go out and play that record. Um, one of the things that struck me at that time w was the fact that I think a lot of that record was pretty hopeful. Like it was a part of a, a healthier part of me talking to the un, the more unhealthy part of me, you mm -hmm. know, like there was, it's, I felt, in other words, I felt good singing those songs still. I didn't feel like I had been misled by my creativity into some sort of romanticism of, of my condition. Mm -hmm. It was actually, I think a pretty, but maybe a clearer eyed, eyed version of, uh, looking at myself or my situation, my condition. Um, uh, so I, that's something I find across the board when I look at songs I've written from any period, even, even ones that sound really, 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 really sad. Mm -hmm. To me, I never feel like I, I can't taste <laughs> a certain amount of hope in and uh, and I sing them all. I mean, we don't. There's really no period of songs uh, in my from my whole life of writing songs that I avoid. Yeah. Um, I play Uncle Tupelo songs on the road. There's some that I just don't like as much, but mm -hmm. but um, there aren't periods that I've had to quarantine. <laughs> you know, that's toxic. Yeah. Do you consider your depression now uh, behind you, managed? with you every day what's the status of it uh managed i don't think it's behind me um i expect to to be confronted with uh challenges in dealing with it for the rest of my life and i'm okay with that i think there are way worse things that could happen to you in your life mm -hmm. uh, and that was a pretty great revelation to me at one point. And it's like, being sad isn't really the worst thing that can happen to you. You know, it's, it's like kind of a part of how life works, you know. I think people really get into trouble when they think that they get to choose their emotions and that, that you just, I don't know, you can stay in one emotion by choice. <laughs>